How many of you know a city named Borislav? Okay, that's a lot more than <laughs> I expected because when I spoke about it with my Uber driver from the airport, he had no, <laughs> no idea what, where it is. So actually, this is the city where my grandfather was born. And he, uh, during the Second World War, he moved to Poland and he stayed in, in Wrocław and I'm from Wrocław. And what I want to speak about uh, today with you is building ethically strong organizations. It's more related with ethical decisions, but um, also connected with the important role of the QAs around it. How many of you are testers? Okay. Are there any project managers? Good. Any developers? Ah, it's not the technical track. Yeah, okay. So, a few sentences about me. So, I'm a test consultant in objectivity. Um, I'm doing a lot of conference speaking uh, last year and this year also. Uh, and I'm switching a bit from testing conferences to, to agile lean conferences. So, because of my interest uh, personally in lean testing and in agile HR. And those two topics are very popular currently more in um, Agile testing conferences or Agile Lean conferences. Uh, I added here like uh, creative leadership, but my friend sitting over there said it should be creative accounting. Because, for example, in Poland, I'm having like my own self-employed company. And I don't know how it works in Ukraine, but in Poland, it, it has to be a lot of creative accounting to survive <laughs> in, on the market. I would expect that in Ukraine is very similar. Uh, but let's go back to the topic. So building ethically strong organizations. So the thing that I want to start with you about is a real scenario that happened a few years ago. How many of you are familiar with the diesel gate at Volkswagen? Yeah, so basically it started uh, in 2015. So there was a change being made to the diesel engines uh, that was making the cars passing the um, emission of, um, of gases testing, but it was not supposed to do this because the engine itself was um, emitting too much of, of bad gases. So uh, it erupted in 2015. Uh, there was dozens of producers of cars that were affected and it was hitting a lot of car vendors not connected with Volkswagen also. It happens to be a lot larger case that everybody expected. So a bit of description about the scale of the problem. So uh, one of the things that happened, it was affecting millions of cars produced around the world by Volkswagen. It was half a million cars produced in the United States. It hit them the most in the US because they got like federal investigations over there. It was affecting all the cars produced in five or six years with the diesel engines. Uh, one of the things that happened was the CEO of Volkswagen. He was fired and he's having a criminal case in the US for cheating um, the, the, the federal organization. Uh, the R&D managers for Porsche, Audi, Volkswagen were suspended in 2015 and they are suspended till today. Uh, the, the group stock market fallen down by one third in like first few weeks of, of when it happens. And it started a dis uh, discussion around how this type of software should be working and how it should be controlled. So there's still ongoing discussion about if this part of the engine of the car manufacturing shouldn't be like an open source and if it shouldn't be connected with some investigations from um, external organizations, not only by the own of the company. So one of the things that happened a few days ago, in 8th of May, the Porsche got hit with a fine, like 500 million uh, of euros. Uh, and Porsche decided not to, um, they decided to follow the, the fine. They, they said, we will pay it and just forget about it. 
The Volkswagen in summary, summary was, was fine over 30 billions of dollars in the US and, and Europe. Uh, the CEO of Volkswagen is charged uh, in the US with fraud and conspiracy. And then there is an awareness that all of the diesel cars manufacturers were maybe cheating and they should be uh, tested. And there was like um, um, in European Union and in the US, there was an investigation checking not only Volkswagen produced diesel cars, but all other manufacturers. And you've got like a list. These are the lists of the manufacturers that were hit later by the thing that happened in Volkswagen. So the Fiat, the, the Mercedes, Ford, Peugeot, uh, Toyota, uh, Skoda, Kia, Seat, everywhere. Everyone were cheating on diesel engines. And that was the reason why they started the discussion if we should control it somehow, because the Volkswagen was only the first one to be catched. There was not the only one that was cheating. And the funny thing is, it actually was a software technology problem. It was a part of the engine, like a hardware, but it was connected with a software build, built on top of that, that was double checking if the engine is working in a normal traffic or if it's being done during the uh, testing on US or European Union Commission. And then it was using the gas different way. There was a controller uh, knew the driver's seat that was controlling this um, gas uh, pushing uh, part of the engine. And it was not like something that is totally only connected with producing cars. It was actually a software that was controlling it. There was a developers behind it. There was testers behind it. Um, there was test engineers being asked to put that device in a car and test if it works correctly. So there was a whole test management, development management process of double checking that device is actually cheating. And then there was nobody raising a hand and saying, this is not ethical. We shouldn't do it. We shouldn't put this type of solution inside our cars. There was everybody in a project that everybody was just running the project. Yeah, let's try, let's try it. Yeah, it's cheating correctly. We will pass all the investigations. It's great. We will produce those engines. And the leadership was just giving a silent approval. They were aware of what's happening, but they were not raising any issue. And on a lower level of the organization, there was like nobody raising any issue. They were just following. If we need to check if the cheating device is cheating correctly, we will just run the test. We will just pass them and everything is fine. So how does it affect the ethical organization? Basically, Volkswagen is like the first huge example of non-ethical organization in the scope of producing a cars because they were producing like um, millions of cars that were cheating. They were putting a huge number of uh, gases and pollution in the air. And then suddenly they are um, for like now Volkswagen is one of the companies that are saying that it's really good that in German cities, diesel cars are being banned from entering the city. Like we cheated, but now we support the government with banning all, all of those cars. But in parallel, the second funny thing is, uh, for example, Mercedes is building uh, diesel engines that are a lot clearer than um, petrol engines. Uh, and it's it's very strange idea because Audi already and Mercedes are saying that all of the sports cars like AMG ones or the S models will be on diesel engines. They will not use um, straight uh, petrol engines like the, um, the, the standard ones, but they will use diesels because they are clearer, they are better and they are uh, much more easier to maintenance. And one of the things that are very important for my personal perspective is that organization ethics are important for employees. I feel like there's always employee needs to understand the decision, but it matters for the managers and the employees that their organization is ethical. So I know a lot of people that just consider leaving their companies or already left their companies just because the decisions they were made on a higher 
level were not considered as ethical. People need to feel that they belong um, to the place they work. They need to feel connected with the values or with the principles that the company is having. There is a lot more pressure or a lot more voice being done by the organizations about their values, about how they follow their values, what the values are. So when I was joining some companies like five, seven years ago, I was learning about the company values, I don't know, two years after I joined the company. And I was like learning or understanding them five years after I joined that company. But now, usually the, the workshop around the values is part of the first week when you join that company. And they try to give you an example of how they operate according to those values. They want you to understand what the values really are, not like the single words or single topics, but the whole philosophy behind them. And I think it's very important for employees to just feel good in the company, to, to, to be connected with those ethics. And ethics in the organization are not only the testers. It's spread from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top, from one side to another. If there is at least one not ethical project in a whole organization, that at some point it will affect everybody. If there is like one senior manager doing not ethical decisions, then it will spread out. And if there is like a single testing team doing not ethical, like making all the tests green, but not running them or not double checking them, it will soon be found out and everybody will know that this team is working not according to the ethics or not according to the values and uh, sorry the companies are usually giving us the the framework or the, the idea how we should operate based on the values uh, to solve our daily problems like who to speak with if I've got some sort of dilemma. If I feel like the company is not giving me um, the support for, for example, I don't want to push this new release candidate to production because there's some problems with it. Even if my test managers is still forcing me to do it, there's a lot of um, other people that I can talk with to try to block it or try to rise my dilemma. And it's always appreciated by the organization. There is not many organization left in which it is thought that this is a bad idea to just be open and speak about what's happening and how do you feel about your projects and how your ethics feel about it, if this goes forward or not. Sometimes there is still a, a, a moment for discussion and sometimes you need to give up some of your ideas or some of your blockers because there's a bigger picture that you need to support. Uh, but usually um, it is connected. Usually the, the ethics affect the people in the organization. If you've got non-ethical boss that is forcing you to run half of the tests and then mark other half as past or as uh, low level priority test cases or something like this, then usually it will be spread around the organization. And all of those things, it affects the employees. So the, the values that the company have, the way how it follows, it affects, for example, the attraction of the new candidates for your organization. So if you speak with somebody that your company is running wrong project management or is not following the values, usually it will be harder for that organization to uh, hire people that you speak uh, with about that stuff. Um, if there is a non-ethical decision being made. It's usually harder for the organization to retain those people. If you are not happy with the ethics, how your company works, you will just basically leave the company. And how the organization can embrace ethical behavior, how you can be recognized as a testers to be ambassadors of ethical behaviors. So, Low-level issues usually ends up with the huge problems, like, like when we look at Volkswagen, for example, yeah? So they wanted to fix like a mission for a diesel engine. Comparison with all the kinds of engines, kinds of cars that they produce, 
it was like a small fix for them. But then it affected them from top to bottom. The CEO is, is in jail. There's a huge amount of money to be paid. The, the, the stock are fallen and everything else. And ex especially the same thing happens usually when we've got our agile scrum projects. Like there's this small feature at the end, like two days before the demo. If we still got the time, maybe we'll just add this small thing inside. And then everything blows up. And it, it's not only a technical issue. It's not only a, a, a way how Agile or Scrum works. The same goes with ethics. If we make something as a solution, and then we've got two more days, and we just decide to do something to pe paint the, the grass green one more time to, to make the project look better, it most often it will hit us in the back like 10 days later or 10 months later. But it will still do. And every small project management decision, if it's a wrong decision, if it's not ethical decision, it will have a huge consequences. Uh, what is the uh, way how the company can help people? Companies should embrace the, the work that people do and everyday decision they make. Your test managers should understand what are the dilemmas or what are the problems that you are facing every day. The, the easiest way to do it is notice people from the test manager perspective, like notice the whole team, spend time with them, speak with them, not only about if we go this way or other way, but just how do you feel about this project? How do you feel about the work you're doing on this project? And how we make you feel better? You need to speak with them. And one of the things is you should give them the freedom to propose solutions. The same way goes if you are just a team member, you're not a test manager. You should speak with your managers that you want to propose a solution. You, you, you shouldn't be only bringing the problems and saying, do something about it. I feel this is wrong and I don't know how to fix it, but you should know it, you're the test manager. Uh, I think it, 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 it's very important to give people um, the opportunity and use the opportunity to, to propose something. Maybe you don't know how to propose a final solution, but maybe you can just show a direction that maybe we should run more tests. Maybe you should, we should have a bigger test team to run those tests. You don't have to estimate how many people should join your team. You don't have to, uh, to estimate or design all the additional scenarios straight away, but it should be, uh, there should be a possibility for you to do this. And one of the things that I feel personally is very important, you need to feel the support for any proactive um, actions or activities that you do. So if you don't approach your managers when the problem already is happening, but you are trying to prevent it, the manager, even if he um, decides to just not intervene in a project, he should embrace you trying to raise an issue that might potentially happen in the future. And I think it's very important for people to just understand that they've got this support from their managers to do the proactive stuff, not to be only reactive when we already are in the middle of huge problems and we don't know how to operate. The, the thing that when you embrace people to do proactive stuff, and if you spend the time with them and speak with them is that you automatically will push the employees to make good choices because they will go to you with a proposal of the solutions and you can either accept their solutions if they are good or if you think they are not the best ones you can just divert the direction in which the solution should go but still you can show the good part of the solution proposed by the testers and to to make it better, you need to speak with people. You need to explain them what are the trade-offs. Because sometimes people always want to have ideal solution and it's not always the best solution. The best solution sometimes it just fit for the, um, for the problem that the customer is having. It don't have to be perfect. It don't have to, to be three years of testing to just double check that, um, that this is the, the perfect solution. To, to push people to make good choices is to have the role models. The managers should promote people who are the role models 
of rising um, in preventing the, the problems to happen. Uh, it's good to have policies defined, even if sometimes it's not a clear way from problem to a solution. The policy is giving the people to a way to be active, to be uh, proactive, to know who to speak with, uh, what are the, the issues they should raise or how they should raise this. And sometimes there are so easy practices, like uh, I loved in some of the companies where I worked was the open door uh, practice, like the, the managers was always having an open door to his room and everybody was free to join him and speak with him about anything that happens. And this is uh, the second part was the open speak. So there was always like a possibility to speak openly of anything that you've got on your chest and you were never punished um, because of what you say. And sometimes you just go use the open door and go to your managers just to, I don't know, invite him for a lunch. It doesn't have to always be a discussion about the project, the problems and anything that happens. But if you've got the manager sitting in a room and the room is always closed, there will be no interaction. Then when you will be thinking about promoting role models, the promoting role models should be done by management, but how can they do this if they are closed in a room for the whole of the day? They need to speak with people. They need to promote uh, those people. And what are the biggest threats that are affecting people uh, in the organizations that might uh, end up with people feeling that they work in an unethical organization or have doubts about if the organization is ethical? So one of the problem is lack of shared understanding of what happens in a project. So if management are closed in a room and you are working in a separate room, Usually there's very small interaction between each other and everybody got their own idea how the, the project is ongoing. Sometimes I was working in a project when I was like working for a few months and nobody speak about me, about the status. And then I got realized that my manager is speaking with his manager about the status of my project. And I had no idea how he was promoting my project or saying that my project is full of problems because I was not speaking with him about the project no, at all. I, we met maybe after half of the year. He just reviewed one of the documents. He writes his issues about it. Then I reply saying the customer has already approved that document. So I hear all your comments and reject all of them. And then he, get, he went to his manager and he gave him update about what's happening in that project. So it, it, it's very, uh, very tricky. Uh, but still, uh, some of the bad ethical decisions are connected with uh, wrong initiatives or wrong, wrong impression of the project. So for example, in Volkswagen, one of the problems was that the senior management was focused on being the, the largest car manufacturing company in the world and they were ignoring all other issues. They were ignoring the diesel problem or other stuff. And, and that's why they give this silent approval for the diesel engines cheating, just because it was the, the, the way to their goal that was totally not connected and nobody in the team was understanding them. They, everybody was thinking that they are cheating the engines just because if they don't put the cheating device, then there will be no diesel cars for Volkswagen because they will be banned for them. But there was never such a risk. They were just not connected with each other and everybody has, has a different idea why are they adding this to, to, to their company. And the similar way happens sometimes in the project management. Sometimes testers are raising some issues and project managers is refusing them but he's doesn't saying that there is an agreement made with the customer, why we go this way, not the other. And there is no clear view what happens around, what's the current situation. Sometimes there's an ethical disconnect between the people and the organization. So people need to belong. People want to fit to the organization. And if there's a different decision being made by the project and a different decision being made at an organization level, then funny things happen. Like, I know an example in one of the companies in, in Wrocław when there were two software houses, for example, and one of them was at least, uh, um, one of them was from Ukraine, that's funny stuff, but they were doing um, automotive projects. 
and the, they got disconnected around the, the head of automotive division in one of those companies, um, being not connected with the values presented by the head of the office. And the thing that happened was that the whole automotive division moved from one software house to another, like 20 people, all project managers, all sales, key accountants, everybody, developers and testers, just moved from one company to another. And that was only because they were not um, connected with the way how the decision goes. And they took the customers with them. They took the business. They could even start their own company. Like the, the division was so big that they could start a third company and just have the projects and do the work. And I think that people need to understand the decision. They want to fit to the organization. They need to understand why organization is doing this way or another. And the opposite, how it goes from uh, the people need to also speak with their problems around the ethics, around the decisions with the management. And they need to get a clear response from them. How about the conflicting stakeholder needs? So in most of the projects when I started at the beginning working, uh, there was like three kind of stakeholders. There was like the customers, there was uh, users, and there was project management or program management. And usually that was the only focus we've got. Like we need to be, when the product manager is happy, then the customer is happy, then the users are happy. That was the line straight connection. But more the more I'm doing the test consulting with different external organizations, I feel like there's a lot more of stakeholders. You have the employees of your own company. They need to understand how your project is going. They need to understand why you push that project this way or another. There is the suppliers. Sometimes you have external vendors that are producing the code or external testing organization or, or external suppliers of the hardware or anything you do. You've got your senior management. You've got your test managers. You've got your uh, project managers, product owners program managers, the, the senior management of your own organization. Then there's the project steering committee. Sometimes it's, again, externally or, or internally, but they are still the stakeholders. You've got your own project team members. So many people don't realize it, that when you are working as a testers and there's a group of developers, they are your stakeholder. And it's not always the best idea to just uh, jump on them with the bugs and just escalate everything and, and just destroy the atmosphere in the project. You need to uh, connect it. There are um, local communities. Sometimes you are doing a project for a particular group of, of people that will be using it. And they are your stakeholders. Uh, there's the white society, like in Volkswagen case. Like they affected the whole global problems with pollution. They affect the whole white society from US, through Europe, through the rest of the world. And then you've got the environment. So sometimes when I was, for example, working in a uh, projects connected with uh, nuclear plants monitoring, the environment was a very important stakeholder. Even if there was no representative of it, there was still a lot of discussions about some ethical decisions that we are doing connected with what happens to the environment if the system fails or, or if that happens or something happens. And you need to understand all of those points of views and you need to balance them either alone or with your test manager or with your project manager, with somebody. And the biggest threat is something will start to be more important than the others. In Volkswagen case, the, the the senior managers were more important than the environment, were more important than the white society, were more important than the, the local uh, communities of different countries, were more important than developers. Because, for example, in Volkswagen case, most of the devices that were used for cheating was um, delivered by the third-party supplier. It was another organization who was building the cheating device, and then that's what happens that all of the car manufacturers got affected because then if it worked in Volkswagen, they start to sell it to different car manufacturers, just saying, 
we've got something to fix your diesel engines. It works at Volkswagen, and they're the biggest company. It will help you. Do you want to try it out? And you need to know how to speak up. So the company needs to push you to be able to speak up, and they give you, should give you the, the, the space to challenge any non-ethical behavior or any not ethical um, decision. Because staying some silent at some point will make you stay silent until you leave your company. I know a lot of people who was on a project meeting, and at some moment they've got a discussion around, uh, should we go this way or that way? And somebody was opposing, then he got like rejected, his idea got rejected at the meeting, and then suddenly he was never speaking up in any other meetings later until one year later he left the company. And when you go with him on a lunch, he got a huge number of great ideas. But he was not willing to speak with their managers about um, how they should operate because he was once rejected and he decided not to speak again. Uh, so one of the things that you need to remember is the, the conflict between ethics and expediency. So the ethical decision is usually not the cheapest one. You need to invest in doing something in ethical way and everybody should understand it. It's, it's, it's a man management decision or it's a project team decision. Sometimes it's, it's, it makes an investment to do something ethically, to just run more tests, to just have more people on the board, to, to, to do R&D around how to make diesel engines better instead of installing cheating devices. It, it's, it's sometimes a lot of, um, a lot of in, um, investments to be made. But one of the important things is you, you as a company can do some short ways during the project development, but you need to remember not to cut the corners too much. So you need to, to, to balance the, the ethics and expediency, uh, but you need to balance it, not always decide, let's do the cheapest way, let's do the cheapest solution. And what I believe personally is that QAs might be the ambassadors of the ethical change. So I feel like the QAs are the best people who can easily challenge any non-ethical decision being done in a project. Because it's usually it's like developers are just those technical geeks that want to just make the code, always use the newest frameworks. Uh, and there will be always testers checking it, so they, sometimes they are even not testing their own solutions. Um, there is the project management, and the project managers are focused on, um, for example, on having the uh, there, um, the, most of their focus is that the, the project should get to the balance. They, the company should uh, earn money thanks to that project, not to over invest in any other activities. And the QAs are the people that are responsible for the quality. And if we rise too many issues, it's not bad. But if sometimes the project managers want to skip some of the bugs or want to to push something to production, even if it's like halfway done or halfway working, there should be a space for you to just raise an issue over this. This is non-ethical because we know this is not working and we want to force the customer to deploy it, to use it. And it's never a bad thing for a QA just raising those questions, raising awareness of what happens. And one of the easiest things that you can do, the first thing is to move from this mess of things like decision making, the current state, to, to some clarity. You have the end-to-end the -end point of view on your project. You know what developers are doing, what the project managers is focused on. You are connecting the business analytic with the developers. You are translating the business language to the technical language. It's the easiest place where you can make that clarity for your own projects, for the people you work with. And you can clarify the ethical trade-offs. It's very easy for you if there's a decision being made by the project that we need to cut something in this area or that area. You always have the best view how it impacts the whole project. If we decide not to run regression this week and move it to another week, usually it's the testers that know what are the risks. 
what happens if we don't run this regression or we only run automated tests and we won't do any sanity testing or smoke testing on a production. It's testers that usually have the bigger picture and for from this perspective, it's better for you to clarify the trade-offs. It's easier for you to speak with the project manager or the product owner and describe to him what will be the effects of this decision or that decision. And this is part that QAs are, is harder for a QA, so this is more management oriented, that the role modeling should be priced by managers, but the QAs, for me personally, they are the best candidates for a role model of ethical decisions. Because it's always easy for a project manager or for the uh, developer to stay si silent about something, but the QAs are very easy to speak about the problems. We, we love to talk about the issues with the code. We, we love to talk about how we went to the user acceptance session and the users were not happy about the project they got or how the documentation is not um, good enough for the customers to use that project. And I think that we, because of that, it's very easy for us also to speak not only on the technical details, but also on ethical details. Like if we go to the user acceptance session and coordinate it, and we suddenly see that there's like people in having, I don't know, 60, 80 years using our software, and then we are using phones in a size of 10, and they are just looking at the monitor and don't see what's written on the screen, it's a lot easier for us to tell to the project managers, to tell to the steering committee that we need to have bigger font, we need to change the project, and to, uh, because um, just fitting in more fancy flashing things on a single screen is not ethical because those people don't understand it because they are older, they understand it because they don't see it or any other stuff. And I think that the testers also should produce like very clear image about the, not only the quality, but about the whole project to anybody, like not only to your product owner or your project manager, but if it's the CEO of the company and he's asking you how this project looks like, you need to provide him a clear image. You need to be ethical from the project perspective. You don't have to push for uh, saying, yeah, it's great. It's wonderful. I know you're the CEO. If I tell anything wrong, somebody gets fired. No, no, the project is good. No, I think the testers are easy place when you can build a clear image about the level of quality, the level of management of that project, anything that happens in that project. And one of the things that uh, I feel are very important is embed the ethics inside the rules. So I think it's very important to have uh, things like test policies, company policies that are um, defining the rules in a clear way. And then it's up to the decision of the uh, project if they follow it or not, but still it, that it should be uh, written somewhere because then the testers can refer to it and can use it. And empowering the individuals, it's something that I told before about uh, um, prizing the ethical um, proactive discussions about the open doors and um, prizing to propose uh, solutions. The, the management should empower individual to hand, handle anything. Like if there will be a testers raising an issue that something being decided in a project is non-ethical, there will, should be management supporting that, that uh, issue, not just, shh, don't tell about it. Nobody knows. Let's keep it clear and don't, don't say about it. Um, and I feel that most of the companies should embrace the higher course, so they should um, understand the ethical decisions being made by organization, by the projects, are uh, finishing up as a, a, as a great solution for, for a company and it's building the great company image. It can be used by marketing, it can be used by recruiting and, and everybody else. And uh, there's all kinds of initiatives helping other groups of people by organizations. Uh, charity and all other stuff, and we should embrace it. If our company is working this way, we, we, we should embrace it. 
So I made a, a bit of a list uh, as a summary uh, how we as a testers can set a stage for a, for ethics, but I feel like we, if I go through it, then we will lose the time for uh, question and answers. So I will leave it. Probably you will get the slides, you will get the video. Uh, so so you, there is no need to, to write it down. But I want you to remember that usually if you feel that your company is not ethical, it's your responsibility as a tester to, to push it to your management, to push it higher, and to try to change your own organizations. And I feel that most of the people enjoy the most when they work in a company where they feel connected with, where they are connected with the values, with the business decisions, and usually basically connected with the, um, with the ethics, how the company operates. So thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Michal. So let's go with the questions. Yeah, hi. Uh, so how do you think, is it possible to revive um, the image of the company after such a huge fail and uh, build this uh, organizational culture from the very beginning and take into account that most of the employees that were part of this ethical incident are still working there? Uh, yeah, very good question. Uh, so I feel like the first thing is it's easier to be proactive and to not allow this problem to happen. Uh, in terms of rebuilding the, the reputation, I think it depends on the size of the problem. Like uh, there is the problem with Volkswagen and I feel like uh, there will be years and years in the future that there will be no trust in diesel engines of Volkswagen. And now there is a problem with, uh, there is a German company, um, they, call, they are called Bayer, and they are producing uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, but one of the problems they did was they bought the company called Monsanto. And that company is doing, is um, producing the Roundup um, chemicals to um, get rid of the plants and it turns out that it's connected with cancer people are getting ill and they are now getting like billions of dollars of fines in the US and I'm very curious how it went further like if the buyer decide to close the Monsanto or close the, pro the product for me personally I if I would try to restart after such a big failure, as a Volkswagen, for example, I would just get rid of the diesel engines. Like, don't produce it anymore and say, we know our mistake, we don't want to do it. Because, but the problem happens that in, in the case of the car manufacturers, all were affected. So it's, Volkswagen is not worse than Mercedes. It's not worse but than Alfa Romeo because everybody cheats. The, the only problem is that there was an external vendor for them that was producing that device and they tried to move it away from the Volkswagen image to that other co company. But I feel like it's a lot easier to prevent that situation to happen than to rea react and rebuild after it. And I'm not sure, I, I'm, I don't have like in my mind example of a company that had such a big problem with ethics and then recovered from it. I don't remember any of those. Totally agree, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Here, here in the front row, there's also someone. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, so my question is uh, uh, how to um, uh, compare uh, organizations that have uh, their own product and uh, out stuff in case if uh, you have two organizations and one of them uh, uh, like making this product for another organization, how yeah. to uh, compare their ethics, their culture and uh, how survive <laughs> in that? 
Okay. When these uh, ethics are not the same or something. Yeah, like okay. That. So, uh, what I would try to do is at the first level, I would try to speak with the project management of my own company, if I'm like a, a member of a software house, for example. Then I would speak with my managers about if things that we do is connected or with how we work. And would try to raise the awareness internally. Um, but if it's connected in the way how we work, but it's not the way the customer works, um, I would propose to my project team to speak with the customer that the things that they are proposing is not how we work and we want to do the things our way. But if sometimes it's the opposite, like the customer wants to have something being done in a good way, but our own software house or a company is doing things badly. So then I would try to reach out to the customer and say, uh, dear customer, uh, we know that your business uh, management um, approach or your way of working is this way. And I'm personally feeling like my company is doing this the other way. Can you please double check or look more careful about this area of our project? So, so I would try to do it both ways. So now, for example, when I'm a test consultant, sometimes I'm like a single person from my company at the client side. And sometimes it's very tricky because I'm totally disconnected with how my organization works. And while I'm trying to work 100% how my customer works. And sometimes it's very tricky because sometimes I need to say to my own managers that uh, I won't do it uh, our way because I'm doing it how the customer wants it. And for me personally, both ways are ethically correct, but opposite to each other. And because I'm working on the customer side, I'm just following customer uh, policies, for example, not my company policies. But you just need to be open in the discussion how, how you want to operate or where you see any issues and just let them to investigate. 